Praise God. I um, <clears throat> spoke to Phil earlier. I said, you know what? I thought the Lord maybe gave me a little something this morning. He said, have at it. You know, um, I, you know, it's always easy to get into a rut or a form, and I, I don't believe we're in a rut and a form here, but, you know, we, the lights come on here because we record, and the cameras, you know, the camera's got to have light to record, and so uh, it's easy to look at the cameras and, and think that they're at some, you know, level of importance. They are. But, you know, what's really important is that we be led by Jesus Christ. We are, we are the body of Christ. It even says there that if, if uh, I think when it was given instructions to the church, it said, you know, if someone's speaking and the Lord gives some, or someone gets something from the Lord, let him ask the person to stop. He goes up there and speaks, and that guy chills out for a while. He says what he's got, and then maybe sets back down. But the, thing, the key thing was if he gets something from the Lord. What we need is something from the Lord. That's always the case. It doesn't matter if there's lights, cameras, no cameras. If you're in a basement, if you're on a street corner somewhere, we need Jesus Christ. We must have him. But the thing of it is, what's so great about the gospel is the Lord not only did he die, but he rose again and he sent his spirit back. He sent his Holy Spirit back and it indwells hearts of men. And he also gives gifts and gives people abilities. You know, there's a lot of abilities and gifts in the body of Christ that are never seen. Those gifts and abilities are just as important, important as the ones that are seen because every joint supplies. There may be somebody that can't even go to church and they're home praying. That's important. It's very important. You know, everything, I don't care if you're teaching in a school, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're doing. When God anoints you, it's Jesus Christ because there's one spirit. There's one spirit, and the Lord anoints people. You would think it's a mundane thing or an activity, but if the Lord anoints you on your job to do something, that's God anointing you. That's just if someone speaks and the Lord gives them a word to say, what difference is there? Our lives are a reflection and should be filled with Christ to where Christ spills out and people see Christ in us. You know, sometimes it's not always what we say. A lot of times it's what we do, and people see it, you know. But I guess this morning, just coming in here, and I, again, I... You know, there was quite a few songs there sung about the love of God. But uh, for me personally uh, this morning, I, you know, we all go through things in this journey that cause us to think about the Lord. I mean, particularly if, we, if, we, if the Lord has saved us, you know, he, as the word says, causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Is that correct? So... That means, and a lot of times, it's the things that we most despise and the things that we would most not want to go through that brings us either to God or back to God. And or causes, you know, he says, every, every branch that in me that bears fruit, I prune it so that it brings more fruit. And if a grapevine could say something, when you prune it, it'd probably say, ouch, you know, it, oh, God, you just cut my limb off or whatever. But you know what? God knows what he's doing. And when that bud comes back, and that, them grapes come hanging on that vine and it's able to be harvested and it's a blessing to others, that's Christ. And that's what we need. You know, the words he speaks, he spoke their spirit and their life. And that's what we need to hear from the Lord. And, um, but I, I was going to say this. In my own experience, the thing that I continue to see and, and, and uh, experience myself is my need for the mercy of God. I'll just be honest with you. If God is not a God who delights in showing mercy, I might as well go home. I might as well hang it up. But you know what? God's character and his love are so in the way that he is and his character and because he does not change despite the situation we may find ourselves in or even our disappointment in our spiritual growth or the lack thereof. God's not disappointed and he's able to fully finish what he started in us. And, and it's because of his character. He does not start that kind of work in a heart that's really turned to him and say, God, they're just too hard to work with. He doesn't do that. We would do that. If we were God, all of us would be in trouble. From me to you, every one of us. We all have a certain level of, of knowing that we need God. Uh, and then, you know, the Lord helps us. And then we get all proud in some way, shape, fashion, or form. And suddenly the one who needed the most mercy is looking down the one who does. That's human nature. I'll tell you what that is. It's pride. But God has a way of bringing circumstances to bear on our lives to where we, it's like we heard uh, Wednesday night. I'll tell you what, the Lord's strength is made perfect in weakness. It's not in man and his ability. It will never be in man. 
all the glory is going to go to Jesus Christ. Because when you're talking about the gospel and you're talking about God, you're going to have to point to Christ because the only thing we all have in common is that we're in desperate need of salvation, rescue, and we're, we're in need of the living Christ because we cannot save ourselves. I don't care. You can do a million good things, and they're all good. They're nothing when it compares to holiness. When you walk into the presence of God, you're going to need a righteousness that's not your own. You're going to have to have that in order to have peace with God. Because I tell you what, we're born wrong. We're born clothed in this Adamic nature. I guess if you say what we inherited from Adam, you know what? It's wrong. It's corrupt. It's against God. We are born with an attitude that is against God. We're also, in many ways, have a conscience that God is left in there. It causes us to realize that, mm, I've got to stand before God one day. And how am I going to stand before this God? But, you know, the Lord has a way of, again, I don't care if you're raised in a godly home, a Christian home, or if you're in a Muslim on the other side of the world, God can speak to you. Because he sees the heart. God is not dependent on a church building to speak to people. He has always looked at the heart before there was ever a building where people would hold what they call church. No, God sees every heart. He sees man. He sees man. He sees his condition. He sees his need. And here's the great thing. He meets our need. And the primary way that he met all needs was through his son, Jesus Christ. Not only did he meet the need through his sacrifice, Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. So not only do we have a Christ that can make us holy, but we have one who today, I mean, it says that he, he ministers in the sanctuary. I don't know what Jesus Christ is doing in heaven exactly, but I know one thing, it says he intercedes for us daily. There's something going on right, I mean, this second in this realm that we cannot see, you can't see, I can't see it, except by faith. Is that Jesus is saying, I paid for those people. They're mine. He loves us. And you know what? God is not separate from Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God, I'll tell you what, I'll say this. God, it says God is love. And a lot of times when we're born because we are, we are born into a corrupt, uh, corrupt world with a natural mind, one of the most easy emotions to give into is fear. And we project that on who God is. And so the fear of God that we have is not really a fear of God. It's not an awesome reverence of God. It's just fear. But God, had, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. So if that's the case, that means that fear that we have is not from God. However, a lot of times God will even use that to get us to go to God to find out who it is that doesn't want us to be afraid. And it's God himself, right? But um, I was thinking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is this right here. When, God, when Christ died for us and he came and he bore every, every person here, no matter who you are or what you're going through, Mentally, physically, uh, if you're scared of God, if you don't want God, you're struggling against God, or you're a Christian who knows God and you're struggling with a besetting sin or you're still struggling in a certain area, God understands it. Because Jesus came here, he came here, it said that he, he suffered when he was tempted so he can help those who are being tempted. It said it pleased him to be made like his brothers and sisters so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. So we have a Christ it's not just he put a bunch of rules out there. He brought himself here. He, he surrendered himself. The word was made flesh and dwelled among us. So Jesus Christ, you know, we're right, right around Christmas time and we you know, celebrate Jesus coming here, you know, as a baby. That's amazing that Jesus Christ came as a little baby. Why did he do that? I mean, it seems like why did he, he could have just came in and showed up as a teenager, but he didn't. In every sense of the word, he experienced everything everything from birth to death and I don't know why I don't know how he, who knows how he God knows how he experienced it because God ordained him to do that and it was by his grace that he did that and in the, in the process he became someone who knows how to meet our needs because not only did he die but when he when he rose from from the from the dead not only had he paid for our sins but he's in the very throne room of God and there is a throne of mercy is what it is Let's come boldly to the throne of uh, grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Is that right? Okay. And so, but, but if, when you think about God and if God is really love, you think it's, well, it's, it's, this love is really what you would call un unconditional love. It's unconditional in this sense 
We couldn't earn it. God didn't look at us and say, well, they're, they're halfway deserving, so I'll do what's needed to help them get the rest of the way through. When we were sin or sinners dead, or dead in trespasses and sin, Christ died for us. Amen. That's an unconditional love, but that unconditional love is conditional on the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of religions out there. There's some that are even in the, in the, they're spoken and talked about in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're dead as a hammer, right? You know, there's, there's some of this love, it's a fluff, candy, uh, I don't know, what do you call it? It's sugar-coated. It, I mean, it's, it's cotton candy. It's, it's weak. There's nothing to it. But God, the true gospel, what it does, it pinpoints sin. It does say, look, you are a sinner. And you are helpless and hopeless without Jesus Christ. But because you are so hopeless and helpless, I came that you might have help and you might have hope. So I'm going to deal with a thing in you that's so wrong so that you can be rid of your fear and your anxiety and everything that's wrong with you. I'm going to restore you through my son, Jesus Christ. And that's how I express love. That love's going to come that way. It's not, it's not just, oh, man, God's love. You know, that's not it. That's not it. It's God is love in the person of Jesus Christ. And I, I, this is something that I read. I read it this morning, and I guess, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm always astounded that when you can read something in the Old Testament and how much it mirrors the New Testament, right? And, and even when it talks about the law, we know we're not saved by the law. The law works wrath. If we, we see the law, basically what we see is that I can't measure up to God. God is holy. He gave that law, and I fall far short of that. So I guess unless it comes some other way, if, if righteousness is going to come some other way for me, it has to come through Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ fulfilled the whole law. Did he not? Okay, so he did it for me. He died for me. He's at the right hand of God to intercede for me and give me the strength and the power. And he's my source of holiness, righteousness, and strength. So it's a, it's a different, the gospel of Jesus Christ is different than the law or like religion. But you know, just thinking about Jesus Christ, he was the rock that followed him uh, in the wilderness. Jesus Christ has always seen himself connected to his church in some way or another. You know, because uh, he was, it says he was even slain before the foundation of, of the world. This Christ, this holy Lord has always, you know, he, he sees us. He sees the depth of, uh, of every human being. He sees your need and he, he knows about all humanity. But I, this is, okay, this, first of all, this is in second Chronicles 30. And um, I don't want to speak too much, too long and say too much. I just want to say what I feel like the Lord kind of helped me see. Um, anyway, this is regarding Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was the son of uh, King Ahaz. Ahaz was a, a king in Judah, and, and he was one of those kings. You know, you read a lot about the kings, and they'll say, and this king did evil in the eyes of the Lord. You know, anything we do, it's in, the Lord sees it. But those kings, some of them were so wicked, and in particular this one Ahaz, not only was he wicked, but when he was wicked, God brought trouble on him. And, you know, usually what you would see is when God would bring trouble, people who wanted the Lord turned to the Lord. And what did he do? He heard them. When people turn, return to the Lord, the Lord hears them. He's a God that delights in showing mercy. That's the kind of God that we have to, that's the one we're going to have to face and you know what? The glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. And one day, all men will stand before Jesus Christ. He says we can't even see God or we'll never see him. But we see God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we see God's love in Jesus Christ and what he did. But anyway, uh, what, what happened was Hezekiah took over after Ahaz died. And he went and the first thing he did, he purified the temple. His dad, Ahaz, had closed the doors of the temple. They weren't even sacrificing anything. They were complete, they had completely almost forgotten God, basically. And even when the Lord brought trouble on them, it said Ahaz did even worse. I tell you what, <laughs> that's hardness of heart is what that is. But you know, when the Lord, that's the one thing about a Christian or a sheep, you know what, we can be pretty hard too. We can be hard-headed, but God has a way of softening us. He has a way with working, you know, he said he would take, take the heart of stone and make a, a, what, a, a heart of flesh malleable or, or soft. That way God can start putting things in there. You know, it talks about us receiving the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. There's something that word has to take root in here and start to grow. And then, and then um, the Lord, does, he does a work in us and it's a progressive thing. But anyway, let me go ahead and read this. Hezekiah takes over. He's done this stuff with the temple. 
Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. It was an invitation. You know that, that parable about the, the Last Supper? It was an invitation. God actually is so concerned for people that he invites them to come. But in this case, it said, okay, he sends out this invitation uh, and invites them to come to, to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. Mm. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month, and they had not been able to celebrate it for a, a regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. The plan seemed uh, uh, right both to the king and to the whole assembly, and they decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. It had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. I mean, they hadn't done it in a long time, and it was written in the code to actually celebrate it a certain way. But anyway, at the king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from his officials. And, that, you know, that's the thing is couriers went out. You know, couriers still go out. There are still people that will give a message, God wants you to come. And that's the heart of it. God wants you, and, and this is, I'm saying me too, I still have to hear the Lord. Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why prayer is so important. When we seek God and look to God, he gives us a sensitivity so he can speak to us. Am I right? We need, as Christians, it's very, real easy to see any level of, of something happens here and there, and all of a sudden, again, we're prone to pride. We need the mercy of God, and we need to be sensitive to his spirit. And that's why Jesus Christ went along with the Father to seek him. And, I mean, he had flesh too. But, you know, it's that sensitivity when God speaks to us. It's like a lot of times that voice is small and still. And unless we're looking to him, we don't even hear it. And we just go headlong in the other direction. Okay, I don't want to get off on a wild goose chase here. At the king's command, couriers, and again, couriers are still sent to talk to people and to talk to them and say, look, come to the Lord. Come to him. This is God's character. I want you to know no matter how bad you think you are, I want you to come to me. The gospel is such to where because Jesus Christ, he died 2,000 years ago or more, that the Lord wants people to know, look, he paid your full sin debt. And as bad as it is and as bad as it seems to you, you need to know there's a God who loves you despite the fact that you've sinned. Because without that, you don't have any hope. But with Jesus Christ, you do. And to me, this is... This is this is what blessed me. This is in the Old Testament, and it's in your know, Old Testament sacrifices. You get it points to something so much greater. Okay, this is what was read. People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, you, have, you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your parents and fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so that he made them an object of horror, as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were, but submit to God. Come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. Listen to this. He will not turn his face from, from you if you return to him. No matter how bad they were and the condition they were in, he says, if you'll look to him, he won't look away from you. That's how good God is. That's how compassionate he is. And um, uh, furthermore, I, I, I thought about that, um, you know, they were celebrating the Passover. And everybody knows what the Passover was. It was when God sent the plagues on Pharaoh and Egypt because they wouldn't. When Moses said, let the people go, he wouldn't do it. And the last plague that was... It was a death angel that came in there. And what happened, he, the Lord warned him and told, he told the Israelites, he said, look, take some blood and put it over the side of the door and over the top. And when that death angel comes, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. There was a blood sacrifice that was applied, and that was their safety and their only safety. And, you know, and, and I thought about this, though, because that death angel came. Those people, those first, all those, it was the first, firstborn that were going to die. All those who had the blood applied, you know, even all those firstborn eventually died. There's something greater than a natural death. 
There's a second death, and it's a spiritual death. That's what we need to be delivered from. And that's what the blood delivers us from, is a spiritual death, right? It, it delivers us and saves us from a spiritual death. And that's what we all need, because it says that it's appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment. That sometimes don't sound very encouraging, especially if you feel like you're in a bad spot. You know, you're thinking, God, that don't sound good. But you know what? Jesus, God sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and that's why the blood has to be applied to our heart. Let me keep going here. Okay, the couriers went out from town to town in Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun, uh, but people scorned and ridiculed them. So some of these people they went to, they don't sound like they were very humble. I mean, they're in a situation where they really need to meet with God and they're just, hmm, not going to do it. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered following the word of the Lord. A very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread in the second month, and they removed the altars. I guess it was the utensils and all stuff that they has. They threw them in the Kidron Valley. Okay, here we go. They slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. Then they took up their regular positions as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests splashed against the altar the blood handed them by the Levites. Since many in the crowd had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lamb for all those who were not ceremonially, ceremonially clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord. Okay, this sentence. Although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulon had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. So on a technicality, they're partaking. You know what, is, what did Jesus Christ say? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And part of eating that lamb is like partaking of Christ. Right, but they weren't technically ceremonially in a spot, ceremonially in a spot where they, they should have done that. Okay, but look at this. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the God who is good pardon everyone who sets their heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even if they are not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Those people were not technically in a position to receive that. But you see the character of God, right? He, his great mercy. He's the one that was sending out the invitation. You come to me. And, I, and the thought I had was this, because I struggle with this myself. There's areas you still struggle with. There may be questions you have. And you somehow think, okay, can I really come to God? Is this situation still seems to be a prominent part of my life, and I'm struggling. God knows about that, and he still says, Come to me. I see you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right? And, and that, that to me, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is about the love of God. And I thought even in this, when the, Lord had, the Lord's one that gave all those instructions and those laws, God himself kind of like he went over that, heard Hezekiah's prayer and touched every one of those. He said most of those people were in that condition. And yet what did God do? He heard Hezekiah's prayer, and he healed those people. That's a good God. I'm going to read one more thing, and I'll, I'll set on down. Um, I hope this is the Lord. Um, this, is, this is Ephesians 3, and this is the back end of, of uh, this chapter, uh, kind of the bottom end. Uh, let's see. I, I'll just read from, from verse. It's the prayer for the Ephesians. This is what Paul says. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp. And this is the thing. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. That is powerful to me. Yeah. That, that's what God wants us to know. And see, because God is love, 
And if we're in Christ, he sees us through Christ. He really does love you unconditionally. He really loves you. Last couple of verses. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Um, I hope this came across in some fashion that would help somebody. I just, I, you know, you see the love of God and then you see it in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's so thorough. It is so thorough that God has made a way that no matter who you are, what your failure is, or where you're at in this journey, whether you know, if you don't know Christ, God says, come. Come. Come to me. You're going to discover love like you've never experienced. You're going to know what it is to live. And you will not know what it is to live without this Christ. No matter what you have, no matter what you do, no matter what you succeed at, the peace of God is worth more than all the riches of this entire world forever. The peace of God, you cannot put a, call, a price on it. You know what else there is? Joy. Love. There's, it's Christ is what it is. That's what we're going to share for eternity is the attributes and the character of God lived out through us forever. That sounds like a pretty good deal. And, there, you know, why would anyone turn away from that? You know, the, the thing of it is, is people's eyes have to be open. Sin blinds us to the goodness of God. But that's why God allows people, I guess it's sometimes to speak to it, to people who may haven't heard it or, or haven't yielded to it, to say, I want you to listen to me. I love you. And as unholy as you think you are, I provided a way for you to be holy accepted by me and loved by me yeah. that's who god is yeah. so uh i think that's i think i've said enough i just want to share that Amen.